Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation with Leo Laporte, episode 65, recorded August 15th, 2012. Evernote's Phil Lyman. Triangulation is brought to you by Ford. Ford invites us tech geeks to join the conversation, submit ideas, and grab your tech geek badge at social.ford.com. It's time for Triangulation of my favorite show of the week because I get to sit down with some of the most interesting minds in the business and talk about big ideas. And we've got a really big idea guy joining us today. Phil Leibin is here. He is the CEO of Evernote. And I know if you've listened to any show I've ever done, you've probably heard me sing Evernote's praises. It's a, it's a note database. Actually, uh, I think kind of started on Windows uh, as an alternative to OneNote. That's the first time I experienced it. But unlike... Microsoft's OneNote, it's free. It's always been free. And now it runs on everything. iOS, Android, Windows Phone, every desktop computer, every tablet. And once you put your data into Evernote, it syncs everywhere. They've got all sorts of nice features like built-in OCR. They have a freemium model. It's free. But if you want to pay a little bit, and it's not very much, uh, you can get additional features like that OCR and so forth. Let's welcome Phil Leibin uh, to Triangulation. Phil, it's great to see you. It is awesome to see you again, Leo. Huge fan, as as you know, of Evernote. I have been for uh, years. That was a kind of a quick description. Well, thank you. But uh, did inaccurate in, in, in uh, any particular respect? Did I make any mistakes? Uh, no, I think I think it was pretty much on the money. You, you get the uh, the image recognition for free as well. So oh, that's it's free. Not okay, good. Users. Yeah, everyone. everyone what do I get that. with a premium service? Jeez, I don't even remember anymore, boy. Uh, you, know, <laughs> <Not> my, <laughs> you know what? I think the truth is, and I know this is true for me, uh, the reason I went premium, which is $45 a year, is because mm-hmm. I love Evernote and I thought this is worth it and I don't care if I get any more. Um, yeah, that, that's that's the most common reason people give. And we, we've intentionally made the difference not that big. Um, you know, The goal is to make the free version really great. So the free version of Evernote is the main version. You know, it's not a it's not a lost leader. The the goal of the free version is not to get you to upgrade to premium. The the goal of the free version is to get you to use Evernote forever. So we specifically make the free version really great, and then we we do have some really cool premium features. So you get, uh, you know, you get you get uh, note history, so you can see previous versions of your notes. You get some better sharing and collaboration features. You get better handling of large documents uh, and stuff like that. So it's really the premium version is meant for power users. Uh, but the free version is really meant to be the the main version and and really great. We don't see the free version as being somehow crippled. It is the main version of Evernote. So Evernote start. Am I right yes. saying that Evernote? I, I remember Evernote using it on Windows. Uh, I was using OneNote. I liked OneNote, and then the idea and the, this is where the name came from. It, the Evernote was it was a little bit different of a model. It was a, it was just like a scrolling notepad, right? Yeah, it was sort of. We had the toilet, the roll of toilet paper yeah. uh, UI. <laughs> <laughs> and and it, and it was just a great note taking program, and I, it was free, and I liked it. And I, you know, I had one note, but I just liked it so much. I actually liked the user interface so much um, that I just kept using it. What, do, have you you've changed a little bit though in your model? I mean, originally then it was desktop software. Yeah, I mean it, it, that was actually kind of a different company. So the you know Evernote has a really interesting history. Um, you know, I think it started in like, you know, 1842. It feels like it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think like originally we sold like equipment to fur trappers or something. No. Exactly, yeah, no. pretty sure. Um, were, were you there, there was, at the beginning, Phil, or were you brought in later? There was actually two companies. So there was two teams. There was a team that was that, that was started by this guy named Stepan Pachikov. I've is met really, Stepan, uh, of course, the Russian. Yeah, yeah. right. So he's, a, he's a, a, a really famous sort of Russian-American, you know, mad scientist genius inventor entrepreneur guy and he had a team of people and it was actually the same team that did most of the really cool stuff on the apple newton like way back in the apple newton days all of the handwriting recognition all of that stuff was done by this team that apple brought from from russia to silicon valley to do the stuff for the newton and then the team kind of stayed around uh and worked on a few of these kinds of technologies so actually most of the 
handwriting recognition technology that's available, you know, anywhere on any platform. Most of that stuff had its roots back in, in what this team was doing. You might you might remember Calligrapher, which was their their handwriting application. Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, you know, and they've been they've been in love with this idea that basically started on the Newton of building a, a memory extension. It was never really about note taking. It's really about you know making you smarter, giving you a, you know a second brain. Uh, and so they were working on this, and they had a company that they were calling Evernote, but it was Evernote with a capital N. Right. Uh, back in 2005, and they had some Windows shareware. And then I put a team together in 2007 in Boston. They were in California. I was in Boston to basically, you know, a very similar idea, give people a perfect memory. And I met Stepan in 2007, and we actually decided to, you know, to join forces. So we kind of merged the teams and uh, restarted the company, uh, called it Evernote, spelled the way it's spelled now uh, correctly, uh, and relaunched, <laughs> you know, relaunched the product in 2008. Uh, so anyone who thinks, anyone who has memories of using Evernote before 2008, you're actually hallucinating. <laughs> no, uh, that was that that was uh, that was the Petrikov version. Of exactly. Evernote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But and, and you know we kept that same. You know it was very much the same vision. A lot of the core technology is the same, but it's a it's a it's a very much a new product. Uh, and when it relaunched as a you know synchronized web mobile PC desktop you know Mac everything version. Yeah, and when you say everything, you mean everything. There's a Mamo version for the Nokia phones. There's BlackBerry. There was a Google Wave Evernote. Yeah. Well, a lot of those, you know, some of those are made by us. A lot of them are made by the developer community. So oh, we interesting. Have, Do you have an API? Yeah, we have an API, and we have more than 15,000 uh, third-party developers. Uh, so there's a ton of oh. stuff. There's thousands of things like that. So, so a lot of the... Uh, a lot of the more uh, you know colorful versions of Evernote for various you know, platforms uh, aren't aren't official products. They're made by the developer community, uh, but we really we really support them. In fact, we're just having our big developer conference uh, on August twenty fourth. Oh, that's uh, nice. in San Francisco, and so we're going to be giving away prizes and really trying to encourage uh, these kinds of apps, but also all sorts of Evernote apps. You recently gave a talk about how your roots influenced. How your how your beginnings influenced you as an entrepreneur? I, I thought it was very. You want to talk a little bit about about that? Well, tell me first of all, where, 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 you have a little bit of an accent. I know. Are you from around here? Uh, I was born. I was well. I was born in Russia. I was born in in uh, used to be called Leningrad, uh, called St. Petersburg. Now. Wow. But uh, I moved uh, with my parents to New York when I was eight. I mostly grew up in the Bronx. So I actually probably have more of a Bronx accent. You do. Well, that's what's so weird about your accent. There's a little Russian <laughs> and there's a little Bronx. It's kind of a strange. Yeah. So that's, do you have memories of uh, St. Petersburg? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was eight. So, you know, I, wow. I, I, I remember it pretty well. I, I, I still speak Russian. Well, it's funny. I kind of speak Russian like an eight-year-old. Right. Like, um, <laughs> But whenever I'm in Russia, you know, we have an office in Moscow still, so I, I go there once in a while, and, and especially if I'm doing any big business deals with, you know, important Russian business dudes, they think I'm adorable. Because <laughs> he talks I speak, like this. <laughs> yeah, I speak Russian like a like a really really polite eight year old boy would. You know, I use like all of the all of the correct super polite ways that you know yes, a well a well behaved eight year old boy ought to address his adult betters, and that's still how I speak Russian, which apparently is adorable. But you know, I'll take what I can get. Well, you know, it's also interesting because Lenin. Grad was uh, besieged by the Nazis in World War II, and a million people died. It was besieged for several years, and I think mm -hmm. it's a scarred city because of that. I think a lot of the people who live there, even if they weren't didn't live through the siege, bear the scars of that siege. At least that was my experience when I when I was there. Did your were your parents there during the the war? Well, my my parents were born right at the end of the war. Okay. Uh, my grand my, my some of my grandparents actually lived through it, and, and it's definitely something that you know I heard about a lot. Yeah, uh, a lot. Yeah, but there's been all sorts of uh, unpleasant stuff that's happened in in, in, in various <laughs> well, parts of you, Russia. The, the Soviet past Union past wasn't such a great thing, and uh, all in all, and then after the fall of the Soviet Union, it must have been nuts. You got out before all of that, though. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I went to the Bronx, and I learned English. I remember this because I remember, like, in the beginning of the summer, I didn't speak any English, and then by the end, I, I did because I, I just came right, right, right at a time when your brain is still soft enough. Yeah. Where you just learn like that, right? And I learned English from reading uh, Thor comic books and watching what's happening uh, reruns on TV. So you talk like a eight-year-old uh, "What's Happening" fan. <laughs> yeah, with, with some North, you know, Norse mythology as imagined by you know, Jack Kirby. You know, in there. it's interesting because Gary Vaynerchuk has a similar story, and that's why he loves the New York Jets so much because they were his way of of uh, assimilating into American culture. Do you have memories like that of, I guess, Thor? Yeah, and actually, I have the actual comic book. 
sí. that, that, I, that I used to learn English with. I bought it years later on eBay because I remembered exactly what it was. It was like wow. a big, you know, it was a compilation. So it was like several in one. Uh, and, uh, and I went on eBay and I bought it. So I actually have, like, this is so great. Like, I, I have... Your you know, first dictionary. The, well, well, the, but I remember, like, I remember the synapses forming in my head, right, as I was reading it. Wow. That's pretty cool. That must be very, very interesting. Were, were you, do you think you were born an entrepreneur? Um, I think I was, you know, it, it was tough for me to hold down a real job. I think whatever, you know. <laughs> that, by the way, I finally realized that's the key to an entrepreneur. They're, they cannot, yeah. they cannot have a boss. Yeah. It's like, uh, I am not going to work for anybody. And so finally, you just have to do it yourself. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely a big part of it. And then a lot of it is just luck. I mean, uh, you know, even at Evernote, I mean, I think it's premature to say that Evernote is successful. But, you know, we, the, the first steps are good. You know, we're, we're, we're so far so good. We're well on our way. When will you say but, Evernote is successful? What would it, what would it mean? What would you need to have before you could say, I think we made it? Well, you know, we have, a, you know, we're trying to build a hundred year startup, right? So we've talked publicly about having a hundred year plan, trying to build a, a company that people are still in love with in a hundred years. Wow. And that's still a startup that's still making fast decisions. So, uh, that's interesting. We start, we start counting from the day we went into public beta, which was in uh, June 24th of uh, 2008. So it's been four years. So we're 4% done. So we've got a big progress bar, you know, installing hundred year company, 4% complete. And, uh, I'll say we're successful uh, at the end of that. It's not very long, four years. Uh, and yet in four years you've become, in fact, so much so the, the app to have that when Microsoft shipped Windows Phone 7, it wasn't until Evernote was on it that it was really a platform. And you were very early on Windows Phone 7. <laughs> we are. And we were on Windows 8 right from the beginning. So we're on it now. So yeah. we're, we're, we're in the App Store on Windows 8. Um, you know, and Windows Phone, and, and they're, they're frankly they're they're good products. Like they're you know when when I first heard about Windows Phone Seven, I didn't want to support it. I said you know we don't really have the resources. Like ah, it's just another phone. I'm not going to support it. And um, but then when I actually saw the early phones, I'm like yeah, this is non-trivially good. Like this is actually like it's good and it's not derivative of anything. Right. And so that's when we decided all right, we're you know we're in and we feel the same way about about Windows Eight. Um, so we, we've got oh, a cool. uh, you know we've got a desktop Windows version. We've got a Windows 8. What's it called now? It's not Metro anymore, right? It's no, it's just Windows 8. Metro. Yeah, so we got that. Windows 8 uh, style Windows app. So, but it is, a, it is we can say, you and I can say Metro. So it is a Metro app. It's not a desktop app. Well, both. So there's, oh, there's both. one of each. Oh, cool. Yeah. So there's two separate apps. Uh, we just love making Will you be apps. on Windows RT? <laughs> Will you be on the tablet? Yeah, yeah. It'll be on the tablet. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, we have, basically, like, we want to make Evernote your external brain. Forever, right. for the rest of your life, right? So right. it's not really about note taking. It's really about making. Uh, you know, the marketing guys don't really let me say this out loud too much, but I think of it as, as as a cognitive prosthesis. Like it's really intelligence augmentation. Like the goal of Evernote is to make you smarter, and we want to do that on every single platform you own. Every gadget that you'll own now or in the future, it has to be a great Evernote experience on it because that's like that's key to you trusting it. That whatever you get your hands on, there's going to be Evernote. And Evernote is always going to be a better experience on your shiny new tablet than on your, you know, crappy two-year-old tablet. And so we make native versions. It's not lowest common denominator. It's, you know, native for each platform. And our goal is to be the showcase app on every new device and platform that comes out. And so far, we've been pretty lucky at that. So that's been great. You have. Uh, that's absolutely true. It's an interesting strategy. The one thing that's missing is Linux. Why, not, why is there no Evernote for Linux? I think I think strategy is maybe too generous a word for this. I think you know we just uh, <laughs> whoops we forgot. <laughs> we just, yeah, we just like we just like building things. Um, we get we get a lot of requests for Linux, and uh, originally we thought, and I and I kind of still think that you know the Linux version ought to be open source, and um, it ought to be something that the community does. And oh so we, we wow, I it. love that. You're absolutely right. Yeah. So we, so, so we, got you an know, API. So, and so there's actually a couple of Linux versions that the, the community is developing that, that we're supporting. And, uh, you know, we'd be happy to support it, you know, financially, morally, spiritually, whatever. Yeah. But I think somebody ought to make a Linux version with our support, but it ought to be a community-developed open source client. So you said it has to be native, and that's an example. That's really native to Linux. It's not, yeah. a, it's not a commercial entity. It's an open source uh, yeah. app. I yeah, exactly. That. I love exactly. that. Yeah. So, so uh, did you go to a college? What did you study in college? Yeah, I went. I went to BU and uh, I studied school. computer science. Okay, uh, and I, I, I dropped out. Um, I dropped <laughs> so did out I. One, it's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, had, I had one class left. I literally had no. One class. 
Yeah, one class, four credits away, and I got into some massive argument with the administration about something stupid. I mean, I'm sure it was just me being an idiot, you know. College. You don't even you don't even remember? No, but it must have been over, you know, some <laughs> bill or something. I mean, what could it have been? I don't know. And I just got furious and I just stormed out. And uh, yeah, one one class left. Um, so my parents have never forgiven me. No, I bet not. So, uh, but I do have I have an aspiration. Um, you know, it's good to have to have kind of goals in life, and I want to be maybe not the first person, although maybe the first person. But you know, like a lot of people get honorary doctorates. Mm -hmm. I want to be the first person to get an honorary bachelor. <laughs> I think like BU I should just you know should just waive that last course and just give it to you. I'll even pay them for the four credits. <laughs> Although, and, you know, at, at, at what they cost when I went to school. I don't know if I can afford them at what they cost now. Uh, and your parents are still alive. Would they, would they come and would you wear the cap and gown and do the whole thing? I think, I, I, well, they definitely would, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think Phil, I'm, I'm the first in my family that's not, you know, a graduate scholar or chess champion. Oh, that's interesting. So you come from an intellectual background. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're what's known as snobs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm the first person who literally doesn't have, you know, like everyone else is, has a, you know, graduate degree. You know, my, both of my parents are concert musicians. My father was wow. a violinist at the Leningrad Philharmonic. My oh mother's my a pianist. Uh, wow. All of my relatives are, you know, writers or scholars or, or intellectuals of some type. And I'm, I'm definitely the black sheep of the family. And there's chess players in your, uh, in your family too? Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's the typical. <laughs> it's all, what you would expect. All Russians was, uh, play chess. It's just required. I was I was supposed to go to dinner um, with uh, with Condoleezza Rice. I remember a couple of years ago, somebody was going to introduce me to Condoleezza Rice, and I couldn't make it. I had some other engagement, and I said, uh, you know, I "Really, would, you know, would be interested in meeting her? Sounds really fascinating. I can't do it." And they said, "Come on, you got to meet her. She's super impressive. She's just a super impressive person." I'm like, "All right, well, what's so impressive about her?" And she said, "Well, you know, she's a concert pianist, and, uh, and 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 she speaks, you know, she speaks fluent Russian, and she's got multiple degrees." And I said, "That that is literally every single person in my family." <laughs> You're gonna, everyone know. Like you're gonna, she's gonna have to do better than that. But there are no. <laughs> she she's, <laughs> speaks Russian. Concert pianist. Big deal, huh? Exactly. Who doesn't? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so you did you program in your early years? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm a, I'm a you know I'm a programmer. I worked as a programmer for a few years. Um, um, yeah, I mean that's how I you know I started programming in. Probably like in junior high school, right? I got my first computer. I had an Atari, uh, Atari 800XL was the first computer I owned. Uh, but, you know, Commodore PET and Apple II were the first computers I programmed on. And, uh, yeah, I've been programming ever since. That's funny. We're getting an Excel mail here because my first computer was an Atari 400, then an 800. And that's where yeah. I learned to program. And uh, are... I was a little older than you at the time. And, uh, and, it, and it has some great memories for me. You never forget your first computer, do you? No, those things were great, and I, you know, I still have. I mean, I, I, you know, this is what eBay is best for, right? A yes. couple of years ago, I, like, I, everything I had in childhood that I have great memories about, like I've got them all. I've got, you know, I had <laughs> Four. remember the Merlin, like the, the the Merlin handheld video game. Oh yeah, those I, like everything that I remembered. I'm like, okay, that's that's eBay. It's basically like the two things from my memories, you know, eBay and Evernote. Anything that happened in my childhood, like just get with eBay. Anything that has five years, that's all in Evernote. Like, eBay is yeah, eBay is a memory. Yeah, it's your brain in childhood. So, um, so what was your first business that you started? Was it as a kid? Was it as an adult? Uh, yeah, I mean, my first business I started in in, in high school. I think I was sixteen, and um, it was really similar, almost the exact same time in the same business as Dell. Um, so we were um, we were buying computer PC parts from Taiwan uh, and you know assembling them and you know just reselling them. So we were reselling PC clones. Me and a, and a friend of mine. Uh, in high school when we were 16. And that was actually the first company I sold. I actually sold that business wow. for $500. Mm. So I made my 500 big ones in that thing. <laughs> hey, when you're in high school, that's a good deal. That's nice. That's good. Yes, it was pretty much the same outcome that Michael Dell had. So we started about <laughs> yeah, it's worth about 500 bucks. <laughs> um, and so uh, you actually had two startups before you uh, came to Evernote. Yeah. Yeah. I started... Um, so um, a bunch of my college buddies and I were at a company called ATG in Boston uh, in the in the mid '90s. Uh, our technology group. We did a lot of really cool. We, that company invented a lot of the modern internet. It was just awesome. Yeah. And uh, we we decided to to just see what it would be like to have our own company. So we started a company called Engine Five, 
because originally there was going to be five of us, but then two of them, two of them chickened out, so there's only three. Um, but we still called it Engine Five, uh, and uh, we just did programming. You know, we build e-commerce stuff. This was right at the very first dot-com um, bubble, uh, and uh, it was great. Um, we sold that company to Vignette, uh, so we actually made a little bit of money. Uh, and then um, we started our second company a few years later, actually one month after September 11th. We started it on October 11th of 2001 because I think everyone kind of – that soon after September 11th, I think we had the same feeling everyone did, which is right. Everyone – you kind of wanted to do something more substantive. Yeah. You kind of uh, – this the stuff we worked on before, you know, collaborative filtering and e-commerce recommendations. Like who cares about yeah. that? We want to do something more, more important. So we started this company called Core Street, which was a, an MIT spin-off up with this uh, really brilliant cryptographer out of MIT named uh, Professor Silvio McCauley. And we started this company to basically do security and cryptography uh, for governments and banks. And uh, that, was, that was pretty great. I mean, we, 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 you know, we made a small difference in the world. Um, but what, it, what, what turned out happening was we kind of thought, well, you know, our first company was for retailers and, you know, that went well, but we're not a retailer, so we were never building the products for us. You know, and then we sold the company, so the company wasn't for us either. And then the second company, we did things, you know, cryptography and security for governments. So we got to hang out with a lot of interesting people, but we weren't building things for us. And we sold the company too, so at the end, the company wasn't for us. And we said we kind of did two companies that way. Let's make the third one for us, right? Let's let's only build the products that we want to build, and let's build the company that we want to keep, and let's never sell it, and let's hold on to it, let's do it for us. Really, that that was kind of the motivation for 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 thinking about Evernote. Cool. You talk uh, a lot about your core values uh, at Evernote, and I'm always interested uh, in in the vision around a company. I think you've articulated that a little bit, but uh, what are the core values that you want to take into this hundred year company? Well, I think you know um, I've actually been thinking about you know about this, and and I, I, I first started being very resistant about about the concept of core values because often when you see them, you know, you see core values written down in a yeah. company. And then they're, of, in a, they're gathering dust in a corner somewhere. They're ignored. Yeah, exactly. And so I kind of didn't want to fall into that trap. But I do think it's important to, 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 to have it. And, and, and kind of the central thing is, you know, we want to build the products that we want to use. And we want to build the company that we want to keep. And so everything that we build, we only build things that we love. We build things for us. Like we, we are the test. And the, the, the gamble that we're making is that if we love something, another billion people will love it as well. And because of how the world is set up right now, because of, you know, app stores and smartphones uh, and social media, and none of these things existed at my previous two companies. Mm -hmm. because, because of these things, the world is now set up where if a billion people love the same thing you love, those billion people will be able to get it the next day. Right. And download it and use it and pay for it. Uh, and so that, that's kind of the big new thing. So we're just saying just make things that we want to use. Don't ever, like, we will never ship anything that we ourselves aren't using. And we, we kind of make Evernote by by being Evernote. Like we create the company by using the product which we make. It's 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 a it's kind of an interesting approach to it. But the culture that we have in the company is mirrored in the architecture of the product, and vice versa. And the other big thing is because of this, there's no exit. There's no exit strategy. That's I was going to ask you because you're saying in building a hundred year company, nobody in Silicon Valley does that. Everybody well, says, well, we're just going to be acquired by Google in three years, and then I can get my boat. <laughs> yeah, um, both. It's probably it's actually a good interview question. Uh, I think I'm thinking of starting to ask people that interview, like, do you have a boat? Because <laughs> it turns out there's a very, very high correlation between boat ownership and people that make all sorts of bad decisions. <laughs> not, not true universally of all boat owners. Some of my best friends, but uh, for the most part, <laughs> that's a very good point. Yeah. It's a very expensive hobby that really doesn't make sense in any in any logical way, I guess. I was thinking of making an app uh, for for the iPhone that'll give you financial advice, <laughs> and it's just going to call it "Should I Buy a Boat?" <laughs> it launches this app and it analyzes no. all of your complex financial information, and then it says, "No, no, not buy <laughs> no matter what, yeah, no matter what, you just <laughs> no. no, no one can actually afford a boat, no one, <laughs> so no exit." No exit. No, it's our life's work. Why oh, do you come on. You, no, no. But if somebody, if I wrote it, you know, if I, there's got to be a number. If I said, hey, well, I'm going to give you $10 billion, there's got to be a number that you would say, okay, all right. Well, so, I mean, there's, there's, there's not magic here. Um, and, and I think one of the main things is we're, we're separating out um, exit from liquidity. 
right? So it doesn't mean that people involved in Evernote can never make money. Well, and you've raised, what, $20 million in venture funding? Wow, we've raised like 140. 140? Oh, that was just the latest round was the 20. 140, okay. Uh, yeah, we, we raised quite a bit, and uh, but some of that was, you know, was for the company. Some, but some of that was secondary, right? So some of that was previous shareholders selling a portion of their stock to newer shareholders. And, ah. and so people have gotten money. People have cashed out. I mean, not not completely, but people, you know, people get liquidity all the way through. Right. At some point, it will be a public company. Uh, I think. You Is know? that so? Okay, so that's the plan. Yeah, and so, but there's no exit. There's no like synchronized event where where it's over. Right. It's just a, you know, an IPO, even when it happens, it's not the goal. It's not an end stage. It's just a step. I do think that's a very smart way to approach it. If you're always thinking about the exit, you're not building something to last. You're not creating something of value. You're creating something to sell. Yeah, and it's just as much work uh, to make something right. that you're going to sell than to keep something for yourself. And then when you sell it, it's sad. Now uh, what? You go, now what? Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, so we just want to build it. And, and, and we explicitly at Evernote, did this because in my first two companies we would always think well who's going to buy us right and and somebody did buy us so that was fine uh but at evernote we explicitly said we're not going to think like we we we, we prohibited people from saying who do you think is going to buy us we said no one's going to buy us Th let's think about who who are we going to buy and that's really that's when we started going out and acquiring companies and part of it was just an exercise in us thinking about flip it around it's not who's going to buy us no one's going to buy us where are we going to buy? Well, and the, and the uh, you yeah. you bought Skitch, which is a wonderful app on the Mac. I guess it's Mac and Windows, isn't it? Well, it, it, when we bought it, it was just Mac. It was uh, just Mac. Okay. Now it's Mac and and uh, and iPad and Android and uh, uh, hopefully a lot more soon. It's a it's a drawing uh, program. I use it all the time. I use it for screenshots. I use it for <laughs> illustration, for drawing, for getting blog posts, and it's just a really handy little thing. Uh, and by the way, I never understood Skitch because they had no revenue model whatsoever right uh basically you downloaded a free app and then they would give you server space and everything <laughs> it did was stored and they never asked for anything and i thought this can't this isn't gonna last why did you why what what was the idea what did you why did you need sketch well because we so we it, it's this it's this thing of just building what we love so uh we loved it we, we wound up using it i love time. it too fact, yeah the first video we ever made at evernote back in like 2008 i think it's probably still up on our blog there's like this like really dorky video you know, that we made about how much we love Skitch. <laughs> <laughs> before you owned it. Yeah, before we owned it. Well, way before. Oh, that's uh, and cute. so everyone in the office used Skitch and used it with Evernote. It's, it's actually like we don't I don't really think of it as a drawing app. I think of it as communication. Like it's a very efficient way to say this is what I want. This is right. what I don't. So like, uh, you know, we're just remodeling the office space. We just moved into a new office space and we did we use Skitch for everything there. You know, you take a picture of a wall and you immediately draw a sketch arrow and you say, you know, put the outlet here. Or, you know, take a picture of, of a table that, that doesn't belong in this conference room and circle it and write, you know, why is this table here or something. Right. Um, and we do that for blueprints. And we do that for pictures. And we do that for, you know, for contracts and just anything, screenshots. So sketch is really a way to like, it's a very primal way to, to point at things and say, you know, me like, me no like, change this. <laughs> Uh, and that's what we use it for, and, and, and it just fits so well into Evernote. So, so that's why we, we bought it, and we extended it significantly. It's not, you know, Skitch was two people when we bought it. Now I think it's a 20-person team. Um, Are you going to do a Windows version? Because uh, 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 really need, we need it on Windows. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we're going to do, do a Windows version. The, the goal is really to have everything on everything. Right. You know, we bought Penultimate more recently. I love Penultimate. This is an uh, iPad app for note-taking, but handwriting note-taking. Yeah, handwritten note-taking on the iPad, and it's, it's just a beautiful app. And again, you know, we saw ourselves using it. Um, so we've actually made five five small acquisitions, and they, they all came from our from our developer community. So all five of them were apps that were in our trunk. Um, oh, that's you know, they were, and we just saw, you know, we we saw ourselves using them, and so we said we want to we want to get them. And the idea is to really, you know, we're not buying companies to give these people an exit either. Uh, you know, like selling your company at Evernote is not a way out. No, you it's, have to work here. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's the start of the eighty-hour, you know, of the eighty-hour work weeks. Uh, it's you know, you we're you, looking for people who 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 think that uh, coming to Evernote is a way to achieve their goals, you know, faster. Uh, and this worked great. And so the and so the you know very roundabout way of answering your number, your question, there is no number that you could write down for which I would sell you the company that I wouldn't rather sell an investor a portion of the company for the same valuation, Got right? It. And that's just the way to think about it. So if somebody came to me and said, I'll buy the, you know, Evernote for 10 billion, I would say, well, wow, that's a big honor. Thank you. And I would turn around, I would go to investors and I would say, would you give me a $10 billion valuation if I sell you 10%? Wow. And they, they would say yes. 
And I would much rather sell 10% and then keep the company but have the same value than sell the whole thing. So the only way that you would ever sell is if a, an acquirer valued you ridiculously more than an investor would. Right. But why would that happen at our, at our size? Like I could see right. that happening to a small company, but we're already in the, you know, in the billions. You know, why would an acquirer value us so much more than an investor would? It's, it's extremely unlikely. So no, it's not heroism. I'm just thinking it's never going to happen. Are, are, you, are you revenue positive? Are you making money? We're not profitable right now. We were about a year ago, uh, and then uh, you know we got to we got to to to, uh, to profitability just on the premium model, and then you know we raised a bunch of money and you know tripled in headcount. So we're we're hiring so fast at this point that we're not we're not profitable anymore. But that was always the plan. So the plan was to you know grow like once we've proven that that the business model works, the premium works really well, uh, we can get to profitability then raise money to just step on the gas and grow as fast as possible, and then you know we can we can return to profitability. Pretty much any time within six months, we just have to stop. We just have to stop hiring as quickly right. as we have been. Right. Uh, but the plan right now is to is to just keep hiring as long as the market supports that. Get as big as possible, because there's just there's so many great things that we can do to make you smarter in, in kind of every area that uh, you know what we want to do is grow. You, when I saw you in Paris in December, you showed me Evernote Hello, which was really cool. You you uh, you take a you give it to somebody and you say take a picture of yourself give me your contact information it was great and it goes right into Evernote mm -hmm. and then Evernote food you take pictures of your food and these are really just front ends to Evernote really yeah um, well they started that way I mean they're 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 you know Evernote food really is going to be a major lifestyle so I just think food is is it, we're interested in having these lifestyle apps for any any portion of your life that's a very information rich portion. Uh, and it, and it, it's, it's an experience, right? It's a way to put things in Evernote, but it also just gives you a dedicated, more beautiful experience. And so right. food is the first one. But there's other really information-rich portions of your life. Not just information-rich, but there are things that get more value. Their memories get more valuable with time. So your food memories get more valuable with time. That's really true. Yeah. But other things do as well. So if you think about, well, what, what other things in your life would this work for? You know, maybe it's travel. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's parenting. Just your first kid, right? Nobody can, you know, by yeah, the time... Yeah, second kid, no. Cares, Third right? kid, but, forget but, it. There's no maybe, you know, maybe, the, maybe there'll be an Evernote, you know, first child app. <laughs> do you do uh, video? You don't do video uh, in these, or do you? Yeah, uh, we you know we actually just launched video in Evernote, but only in Japan uh, and only for, for, for Docomo. So we have a, a couple of months where we're really testing it out because we really needed a good connection. And so Docomo's got this really good, you know, LTE mm -hmm. network. Mm -hmm. So we launched it exclusive to Docomo in Japan. For a few months, and then um, uh, we, you know we will be launching it worldwide everywhere. But at this point, it is available, but it's it's just in Japan and kind of in selected markets. Uh, is some of your revenue model, does, or does any of your revenue mo model have anything to do with how you might use our data? Is it all the money that I give you as a freemium, or premium? I should say premium customer. Yeah, um, so that's really important. Um, we have a completely direct revenue model which means we only make money from you when you use the app and are engaged by it. We don't make any money from indirect sources. So we don't, we don't do any data mining. We don't do any analysis. We don't drive affiliate traffic. We don't sell your data to advertisers. We never actually share your data with anyone. It's completely yours and completely private. We don't do ad targeting. We don't do any of that kind of stuff. So our business model doesn't depend on us being clever with your data. Our business model depends on us providing a service that's going to be so compelling that you'll want to use it for the rest of your life and use it a lot and then choose to pay us, even though you don't have to. Uh, and, and that's just a, I think that business model is harder to get started, but it's much easier in the long term because we don't have to serve two masters. Like the only people that we have to think about are our users. Yes. We don't have to think about pleasing the advertisers or the partners or anyone else. And so it just, it eliminates all conflict of interest that says, we just need to make you really happy and, keep, and coming back and, and, and we'll make money off of that. So that's why we chose it. And uh, it works great. Although, you know, it does take a while to get started, but, but at this point, you know, that flywheel is going pretty well. So it, so it works great for us. You, you actually have done really well. You, you've been very, it's so neat because you're very open with these revenue numbers. I've seen you on the stage with Loic on the webs. Just, you know, you'll say, you'll say, you know, revenue. You're not very secretive, Phil. I'm not. It's it's mostly out of laziness. Um, <laughs> I'm know, like you. Like, I can't remember what I've said or who I who knows what or what. I just said well, yeah, whatever. Yeah, exactly. You know, like I, I have to know these things anyway because my board my board asks right. me. So they want to know. know from the board. So hey, if I'm going to do the trouble of putting together a slide deck for the board, I may as well use <laughs> it on stage. Yeah. 
You have this is a, I, I, this is new to me. I don't know if it's a new product to you. Evernote clearly. Tell me about that. This is interesting. This is like a reading, like a, a, a readability or something. Uh, yeah, clearly is. Um, uh, it's a really cool app. So right now it's an extension. It's a Chrome extension, but we're, we're, it's coming to, to to other platforms as well. And the goal is to just give you a, is to is to increase your comprehension of long form written stuff on the web. Uh, which in the current version, what it does is, you know, you push it and just it just cleans everything up. It just gives you a beautiful reading experience with no distractions, and you can customize it. Uh, and then you can, you know, you can you can easily clip things to Evernote. It's just it's just a it's a reader um, for for Chrome. But what it's really going to grow into, and, and in fact, we're gonna we're gonna be launching uh, new versions of it fairly soon. Uh, what it's really going to going to grow into is not just a way to to get rid of things. It's not just a way to clear things up. It's a way to help you understand things better. So the first step is to get rid of distractions, but then the next step is to add things that actually improve your comprehension. Uh, so they'll be so. So basically, clearly, is a way to make you smarter about what you're reading. And um, that's I'm interesting. Really psyched I mean, about it. It's kind of like footnotes, automatically generated footnotes or mm -hmm. links and things like that based on the content. Yeah, exactly. And How and you know, done done in a way so that the first you know the first rule is like don't ruin it, like don't don't right. clutter it up with stuff. Right. But you know, there's 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 things that we can add that I think uh, that I think would work really really well, uh, and uh, it's great. And you know, we also have um, we have our web clippers, uh, which you can you know as, as I use as those well. all the time. And the Chrome one, uh, the, the new ones are really good, both for Chrome and 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 Safari and and Firefox. Uh, and we just added uh, we added some cool new features just in the last version. Um, we added related notes, so now when you clip something. Uh, you actually see other things from your Evernote account that are similar to what you just clipped. Oh. So it's a great way to kind of have like very serendipitous discovery of you know stuff that you've already seen before but maybe forgotten about. We're going to be doing a lot more of that kind of stuff. Yeah, this is when it starts getting really interesting. So people have for four years been putting stuff, as I have, I have hundreds and hundreds of notes in Evernote, putting mm -hmm. stuff in there. And now it gets really interesting what you can do for me based on what, what Evernote knows. And again, I, I think it's really important to underscore, and you're not sharing that with third parties. You no. do have ads, though, yes? We don't really have ads. So um, what we have is in the desktop clients, so on, on the downloadable Mac and Windows client, right. we, have a, we have a section that we use to promote uh, our own stuff and partners. Okay. Uh, and we don't we don't really make money from that. I mean, sometimes you know. So and the, you can close that window. I notice you can just you can close the window, yeah. Uh, and uh, you can just get rid of the whole the whole panel. Right. Uh, and we're we're going to be changing that in, in in subsequent versions to really like to really get it further away conceptually from ads. They're really they're really recommendations. They're they are ways for us to surface ways that you can make Evernote more awesome. And it's it'll you know totally optional. You can get rid of it. Um, Right now, you can close it completely if you're a premium user, but anyone can just can just slide, you know, can just close the right. whole panel and get rid of it. Um, but yeah, but in the future, we basically like the fact that some people perceive it as ads is not that's not what we want because we don't. It, it's not a significant portion of our revenue. In fact, I think we make almost nothing from it. Uh, so we're going to be changing that to really just be, you know, uh, recommendations, uh, recommendations of integrated stuff with Evernote. Right. So the products that we really like, that we use, that, that, that works really well. And, and they're, really, they're really popular. So even though you can, you can get rid of them for premium users, most of our premium users actually don't get rid of them. Most people have them on because they kind of like what's in there. You, you've had, you, tell us a little bit about the freemium model because you, for a lot of people, are the role model. Uh, you know, people, when people say, oh, freemium doesn't work, they go, well, tell that to Phil. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's working for Evernote. The, free, the idea is you give it away for free, and by the way, it's almost the full version. Mm -hmm. And then some people, what percentage of people end up buying it? Well, um, I think overall it's, it's right now about 4 to 5%. Tiny percentage. Um, yeah, well, but actually that's, not, that's, not, um, that's actually not the best way to think about it. So if you take the – what happens is um, the goal of Evernote, right, is, is to get better. The longer you use it, the more valuable it gets to you. Right, because of the subject matter, because it's not just notes, it's really your life in there. So the longer you use Evernote, the more valuable it, it gets. And the higher your perceived value, the more likely you are to pay for it. So what we actually see is the percentage of people that pay goes up with time. So in the first month, like people who just signed up for Evernote one month ago, in their first month, only one third of 1% of people pay. Hmm. Right? Why would they? Right. But after a year, it's like 6% of people right. pay. Right. And it's not because they run out of room because, you know, we don't have an overall quote or anything. No. You know, we, 
Um, but after a year, it's already 6%. And after two years, it's 12%. And after four and a half years, right, we have about four and a half years of users. After four and a half years, it's like 26%. That's interesting. 26%. So once people become, de sign once people become dependent and really get it and they say, oh, this is useful, it's worth $45 a year for me. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and even though you don't have to pay and, and there's no paywall, you don't, right. you don't like hit a wall where you're like, oh, now I have to pay. Right. The longer you use it, the more, the more you convert. So, so when I say the average is like, you know, four or 5%, that's kind of meaningless because right. that number is, is more influenced by how quickly we're adding new users. Right. And it's really the old users that are the ones that, are, that we're making money on. And you are adding new users quickly? Yeah, I think we're adding, you know, 60,000 60, a day maybe on average. Holy I think, you know, on a, on a good day, sometimes like 90,000. On a bad day, maybe 45. But yeah. And this is all organic, right? We don't, we, don't do any, like, we don't do any advertising. We don't pay for users. We don't do any like no. incentive downloads. Yeah. And this is actually, I think, the most interesting. It's not actually viral. Um, we are actually adding some social features uh, uh, soon. We we're kind of rolling this out very slowly. But right now, there's very little virality in Evernote. So even though it's word of mouth, right. like Evernote just grows because it's you all tell word your, of mouth, yeah, all word of mouth. Um, but it's but you don't tell your friends to use Evernote because you want to use Evernote with your friends. No, you just tell them because it's great. Right. And and so even though it's not strictly viral, it still grows. It still grows that quickly. And I imagine that the growth of mobile has been very good for Evernote. I mean, you're well positioned because one of the big problems it solves is I have this little device that doesn't have doesn't know what everything my desktop knows. I put mm -hmm. it in Evernote, and and it just syncs. And and that's the main reason now I use it. And it wasn't yeah. certainly what anything I contemplated when I started using it. Yeah, and mobile's been really good. Uh, about seventy five percent of our new users. Their first experience of Evernote yeah. is on mobile. That's what I would guess. And that's guess. basically because, yeah, the App Store discovery is so good. Right. But most of those people then go on and also download us on Windows and Mac um, and use us on both. And, and uh, yeah, it works great. It really, I think Evernote really, it really doesn't become magic until you're using it for more than one device. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and then, it, and the, the synchronization is an important part, but it's really not so much a synchronization. It's not just moving bits around. Uh, it's really that, that, it's the full intelligence and search and context exists in both places. And then you can use each device for what it's best at. Right. So like I, I, uh, many people actually use Evernote simultaneously. Like I've, I've been at conferences, right? And I see people like, like sitting at a conference and they've got their notebook open, they've got their MacBook and they're using Evernote on the Mac to actually take notes. And then at the same time, they're using Evernote on the iPhone to take pictures. And those two are just syncing. So it's like they have both devices with them. But the phone is better for pictures, and the, right. and the MacBook is better for notes. So they're just using both without even thinking about it, and it just kind of works out. I use it for talks. I use it for serial numbers. I take pictures of where I parked my car. I mean, the, the uses are very, very wide, uh, yeah. and it and it and it really is a hideously useful <laughs> little tool. It's just Thank become you. it's become something that I have to put on uh, every device. I've got a um, uh, just moved into a new house. And um, uh, I'm kinda, I kind of have a, a mild emergency. So, so this house is a very small, very small wine cellar. It's the first time we ever had a wine cellar. But it's, a really, it's basically a big closet. It's a small wine cellar in there. Uh, but it, it wasn't set up. It was just, you know, but it was obviously meant to be a wine cellar. And, and when my wife saw it, she said, oh, this would make a great closet. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. it's not a closet. It's obviously a wine cellar. We're going to keep it as a wine cellar. <laughs> and she's like, you've never stored wine in your life. Yeah, but <laughs> You drink I'm, it. I'm, the problem is you drink it. You buy it, you drink it. <laughs> so, so now, like, now that's a big Evernote use case for me. So, like, I need to, like, I need to use it to, like, you know, figure out what I'm going to put in the wine cellar. Right. And take I got I to architect it. I got to take pictures. I got to plan it for a few years. So, like, I got to show her that I'm totally serious about this, that it's totally not a shoe closet. It's definitely a wine cellar, and uh, like Evernote is definitely like coming to the rescue for that. I well, I uh, yeah, absolutely. I it, I use it that way too. I take pictures of wine. I, are we going to see Evernote wine a uh, to go with Evernote food and uh, and and? I think Evernote uh, food will just will just encompass that wine. Yeah, yeah. Let me. Uh, w you probably have some good information about Android users versus iOS users. Do iOS users tend to be more freemium payers? They uh, how's the iOS platform doing for you compared to android platform how about discovery and android yeah um so they're both they're both doing really great uh, i'm really happy about both platforms um they're they're just about neck and neck in terms of number of users and, and, and new users uh which is really impressive i mean android has really grown quickly yes. and at first, about a year ago i thought android would overtake ios uh, in terms of new users but but ios actually keeping up so they're Good. both just go growing great they're both strong. in terms of the 
in terms of the monetization, uh, they're also pretty good. So um, Apple users in generally uh, uh, are more profitable than non-Apple users. So like uh, our average revenue for across all users, you know, obviously free plus premium, our average revenue for iPhone users is like $1.79 a year, I think, uh, just from freemium. And our average revenue from iPad users is like, I think, like two thirty five, mm-hmm. and our average revenue from Android users is like a dollar nine. So like it's like a dollar nine for Android versus a dollar like seventy nine, I think, for, for for iPhone. So iPhone is more profitable, but it's not like the twenty to one thing that you hear some developers talk about. You hear people right. say like, oh, we totally can't monetize on Android. Right. No, for us, yeah, like it's not it's not quite as profitable as iPhone, but it's still really profitable. And it's worth it. Yes, absolutely worth yeah. it. Yeah, but I think yeah. part of it is like we're not trying to monetize it by showing ads. You know, we're not trying to monetize right. by having paid apps. In those ways, I think Android is much harder to monetize. But since we don't actually monetize the phone, we monetize your overall experience with it. Um, it, it just isn't, it isn't that much less. What percentage of Evernote users only use it on one platform? It must be a small number. Yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's about 45%, but most of those include um, That's new people users. who really only use it like once or twice. Right, right. So if you go back, if you're like, okay, People who've been using it for a few months, it's, it's smaller right. than that. Yeah, yeah, that would make sense. We're talking to Phil Leibniz. He's the CEO of Evernote uh, and, a, and just one of the most interesting and open, uh, which, you know, I don't normally, I really hate CEO interviews because <laughs> CEOs are so careful about never saying anything interesting at all that I just don't do it. And Phil's one of those rare yeah. exceptions where you just, it's, he's a treasure trove of stuff. <laughs> Not a good CEO. <laughs> You're a crappy CEO, but a great interview. No, hey. I'm kidding. He's a great CEO, too. And I think every... In fact, uh, our, our good friend Rafe Needleman just went to work for you. Yeah. 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 Love that Rafe. Was awesome. I yeah. was so I was super psyched. Yeah. Uh, that. What's he going to be doing over there? He is heading up Developer Voice, which is a, a new platform, a new program that we have basically to help, uh, to basically advocate for and 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 improve um, our developer community. Oh, so the idea great. is, it is this, like like I remember when I first talked to Rafe, right? Like I first pitched him on Evernote, you know, tried to get him to write a review, you know, years and years ago. And I remember how terrified I was, right? Because like, you know, he's Rafe Needleman. Like I don't know, he's gonna he can write a review, he can say that we suck. Uh, I don't really know how to talk to journalists. Like it was, it was, you know, wasn't as nervous as I was the first time I talked to you, but I was pretty nervous. <laughs> And, and, I, and I realized, like, I don't know, like, I didn't know anything about how to do this to make it to make it right. So years later, what, what we hired Rafe to do is to, is to work with our partners uh, quietly, you know, behind closed doors to work with our partners, both the small ones, but also some of the really big companies we work with and help make their products really great by basically telling them, like, OK, like, if you were going to be pitching me as a reviewer in a few months, like, here's the stuff that I'm going to pick on. Here's the stuff that could be improved. Like, here's how to make you here's how to take the product from good to great. So he, he does mentoring to, to, to make the products great. And then the ones that actually make it, the ones that are great, then he talks about. So he's going to have his podcast. He's going to have a show. He's going to do all of the media stuff that he was doing, except he'll be out of Evernote. And he'll be, he will be talking. He's got total editorial independence. Uh, he will be reviewing and promoting the really good stuff that, you know, that, 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 uh, that, that the community uh, produces. That's really great. We're talking to Phil Leibin now. This show's called Triangulation. It used to be you, me, and Tom Merritt. But now the audience is the third leg of the stool. I'm going to give you guys a chance to ask Phil your questions in just a moment as we continue. Phil Lyman, CEO of Evernote, is with us. So chat room, get ready. Your chance to ask Phil your questions. But first, a word from Ford. The show brought to you by our great friends at Ford. They have a new site they want you to know about, social.ford.com. This is actually really cool. It's a chance for you to uh, read about Ford, to interact with other Ford owners, to get yourself a geek badge. They have, if you look in the upper right there that says grab a badge, I'm going to get the uh, the Mustang badge because I drive a Mustang. Although some of these old ones like the classic are pretty cool. But go over one more, Chad, you'll see there's also a, a tech geek. You can get the tech geek. There it is in the lower right there, the tech geek badge. Uh, you can pass it on and... Pass on your passion for Ford. There's also some great features uh, like uh, an ideas section where people put incredible ideas, things like uh, a wind turbine under the hood to charge your lithium-ion battery. Um, I cannot bear to hear of another child dying from accidentally being left in a hot car. New cars should be equipped with sensors that will cause an alarm to go off when the temperature gets to certain... I love that idea. That is a great idea. A car seat alert. 
Um, so this is a really neat site, and I want you to visit it. And there is an article there I wrote because a couple of about a month ago, I got a chance to talk to Jim Buchkowski, who is a technologist at Ford, about technology in these vehicles. And I just found it very interesting. So we wrote up a little bit of a summary uh, talking about the apps that are coming to the Sync platform. Um, gee, I'd love to see Evernote on my Ford Sync. Oh, maybe I should ask this Leibn guy if he knows anything about that. There's a whole API, you know, the AppLink API. Uh, just like Evernote, Ford's treating the car as a platform and encouraging developers to write apps for it, to interact with it. Um, they also are doing things uh, like more autonomy. Uh, they call it driver assist, things like lane departure warnings. They have uh, an onboard cameras now that center the car in the lane, things like that. Uh, and also, this is interesting. I don't think they've implemented this yet, but the idea of workload information management, because during a higher stress time like heavy traffic or bad weather, they want to kind of make it easier for you to pay attention to driving. This is a real safety feature. I love it. Social.ford.com. Check it out and read my article, my interview with Jim Buchkowski about Ford. Social.ford.com. If you people have some questions for our guest, uh, we, will, um, <laughs> we will ask them of uh, Phil Leibin, the CEO of Evernote. Uh, do you think there'll be a Google Glass version of Evernote at some point? Now, that I'd like. Oh, man. You know, uh, so we bought like five of those things. Did we you? Had, we, had, we had five people at Google. Yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, by the way. So there's a meme that I'm trying to start that I'd love your help with, <laughs> okay. you know, which is I'm trying to start a meme that it's actually pronounced Googlio. Googlio um, is much better than Google I.O. I agree. Yeah. So every time somebody says Googlio to me, I say, well, you know, at Google, the smart people, they really say Googlio. Now, that might not be true because I've never actually heard anyone at Google say that, but I, I think it's a better name. <laughs> um, so I would Good like luck. To start well, I bought, I bought, I have 747. What numbers do you have for the Google Glass I, I don't, I don't that's remember. The, this is the meme I'm trying to start, is yeah. who has the lower Google Glass number. Right, I'm going to find out. So we have five. We bought five because <laughs> we had five people. And uh, we got them immediately. And uh, I actually instructed them. I instructed them to just basically, I think my exact instructions were, uh, stretch your arms out and just make a fist and start windmilling your arms around and punching people until <laughs> it gives you one of these glasses and then immediately bring it back to the so office. So you actually have the glasses? No, we don't. No, we don't. you have this. You have the number. You have the little glass brick. Exactly. We have yeah. five of them. Yeah. And uh, we're going to get them as soon as they're out. And I am trying to pull every CEO string I have to see if I can get one earlier. I've been like, I've been stalking, you know, Larry. So it sounds like you're excited about the idea of these. I'm all over it. We know exactly what we're going to do with them. It's, it's just going to be the best thing ever. So, yeah, we don't have them yet, but uh, I, I really hope we do. And we are totally putting a team to work on them. Well, we already got a team, you know, thinking about it before we have any. But, uh, yeah, it's going to happen. That's so, cool. Like, I love it. It's great. Rock Law writes, I just want to say thank you for Evernote. Used it today at the farmer's market and the grocery store. Oh, here's a, a good application. Entered the list on my Mac. And then I read it on my iPod. Also, I love the Web Clipper tool in Chrome. Use it all the time. Thanks for the great service. Thank you. I never thought of it for... Uh, how about... Uh, now, dictation is really big in iOS, and Android's doing a lot of that. Is there mm -hmm. Siri integration, I, or, or can you even do that? Well, so I don't think there's Siri APIs yet. Um, they, they don't let you. Out. Apple doesn't let you, do they? No. Um, you know, we, we, do, we did publish a hack for how to, how to get Siri to send things into Evernote using our email gateway. Uh, oh, you know, that's everyone... right. You can email Evernote. Yeah, and that, actually, that works pretty well. So you can just say, you know, send to Evernote and whatever, and it'll do it. Uh, our, in iOS 6, the dictation stuff all works with Evernote. And in Android, um, well, I should say in iOS 6, I think it all works with Evernote. iOS 6 is not, not out yet. So right, right. Know, we don't know. Hard to say, hard to say right. for sure, but, right. but I think it's going to work. We've certainly, we've done a lot of work to try to make it work. Uh, and then um, in uh, on Android, our new Android version, actually, we, the dictation works really well. We actually have a new feature uh, in our Android app where if, when you, now when you take a voice note, you have the option of saving the audio or the or, or the audio and the transcript together. So you can oh. actually get both. So it's actually really cool. But that's only on that's only on Android. Apple doesn't let us do that yet. There's no but, API. Uh, but hopefully yeah. they will soon. And that's the transcript that comes from Android of what you said. And actually that's handy because sometimes the transcript is really nonsensical. Yeah, you really you really want to get both. And then yeah. we do have several um, there's a couple of, of third party apps in, in the Evernote trunk that do uh, like various human assisted and fully automated transcripts as well for you know for extra money so through third party so if you just check out the Evernote trunk you can find a few a few apps that do that 
Web 2771 uh, says, uh, I mentioned the OCR. Tell us a little bit about the OCR and how that works on uh, on Evernote. If you're a premium, I guess it's even if you're a free customer, you get it. I'll take a picture and then Evernote magically seems to understand the text in the picture. Yeah, so, so you, you take a picture and then we send it up to our servers and all of this processing is on server side. So it, it takes a few minutes, you know, because you have to sync and then sync back. But usually that's fine because, you know, you don't really have to search for something if you just took a picture of a minute ago. Right. You typically still remember it. Um, and it, it, what it does is uh, it runs it through this pretty complex set of algorithms uh, that really go back, you know, the roots of them go all the way back to the Apple Newton days for us, uh, from what the team built. And so the first thing it does is it tries to, it looks at a picture and it does all sorts of cleanup, right? It does all sorts of texture correction and contrast and just sort of cleanup. And then it tries to figure out what parts of this picture might have text in, on them. And that's actually the hardest part because we have to say, well, you know, because we're not getting like OCR pictures of like a document from a scanner, right? We're getting like a picture from a cell phone uh, of, you know, a scene with maybe a, you know, a highway sign or something and some other stuff. So we have to figure out like what's text and what's the tree and, you know, what's a car, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of classification. That's probably the hardest part. So it Once, sees a tree and it adds the word tree to it? Not yet, although that's, that, that's coming. But, but what it sees that's now is it, it sees, it sees text and it says, I don't know what this is, but I know it's text. Okay. Um, and then, and that's actually really hard depending on different languages because like something in Japanese or right. something in Arabic actually looks really different than something in English. Right. But you know, a person can do it. Like you can look at a picture and you can see there's text in it, even if you can't read the language. So Evernote does that. Then once we figured out that there's text in it, then we cut out just the squares of the rectangles that have text. And then we feed them through several OCR engines, some that we wrote, some that we license. Wow. We compare the results and, you know, and then we say, well, there's, you know, a 15% chance that this word says, you know, triangulation, and there's a, you know, 5% chance that it says, you know, something else. And then we store all those results so that when you search, uh, it comes out. And, yeah, this is all done kind of behind the scenes on the server side. Uh, Data Mafia must be a, a, a DJ or does – he says, I move – he says, I use Evernote to move audio configuration files between my production machine and my performance laptop. Thanks for a great tool. That is, that's an awesome use case. That's you know, great. I actually do that all the time where I have some sort of data. Uh, you handle PDFs. You yeah. handle text. I could type in text pictures. So I have some sort of data. I'll put it in my Evernote. And now it's on every device uh, that I use. Um, a number of questions about the UI. Uh, mm -hmm. Web5826 says, uh, are you going to do a UI refresh? Is that in the roadmap? You've done quite a few already. Well, yeah, so it depends on the platform. So there was a major UI refresh, refresh on Android. Yes, um, there is a very big UI refresh coming on iOS, Mac, and Windows, uh, which is uh, we've been working on it for for about a year, uh, and it'll, it'll be out this year. So yeah, cool. we do have uh, we do have a full UI refresh. You know, we've really figured out a lot of things about how to build apps. Uh, you know, we're 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 pretty much the oldest app on iOS because right? we were there on the first day the App Store launched. Right. There's no there's no iPhone app older than us. Same for iPad. Uh, and Same for Windows Phone, right? You were at launch partner in Windows Phone. Oh, I don't know if we were, were there. Maybe right a, day launch, or a few days after. Soon. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So all of so so basically, we are doing full refreshes. We've really gotten much better at that kind of stuff. And what we've really figured out is that, you know, simple is hard. Like it is so hard to make something yeah. simple. It's much harder to make something simple than to make something complicated. Oh yeah. And um, but I think we're getting better. We're getting better at simple. So there's a, there are new UIs which are you know much better. Uh, love the simple. love the new Android look. I really like it. Thank you. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, I wish it was on iOS since that's what I use mostly. Yep. Uh, but yeah, and but the iOS one is not going to look like the Android one. Like our whole philosophy is we don't do lowest common denominator. Right. You know, we do the best possible experience on each platform. So the iOS one is going to look. It's going to be like the best looking iOS app. It's not going to look like the same version that's on Android. That's how it should be native. Yeah. Uh, so Euro nerd, he's from Europe, so he's concerned about privacy. He, yeah. he says, I'm less nervous about putting my data on your cloud. Would you ever consider having some sort of, you know, roll your own Evernote server system so I don't have to give you my data? Well, um, maybe, although, although not for a while, because this idea of, you know, having an Evernote server or something that you can install is it, it, a lot of people ask us, particularly a lot of companies, but that's, that's really difficult. Um, and it would be weird because then, you know, you would have to have like, potentially different versions of clients. Like it would right. just basically be a massive difference in this model. Yeah. So 
Probably not. Um, the real answer, I think, is how do we make you trust us with the data? That's a good question. Uh, well, I can yeah. tell you one thing I'd love, and I don't know why you never had this, global encryption. Why can't I just encrypt my files? I can do um, an individual note. Yeah. Um, so global encryption uh, is, is tough because um, if <laughs> so, so my previous company, as I said, right at Core Street, right, we spent seven years, we were doing encryption, we we're doing cryptography and, you know, cryptography and security for, for governments and kind of big banks and things like that. So I know just enough about it to know that there's basically two kinds. There's complete nonsense, fakey, fakey encryption that makes you feel good, but doesn't actually do anything. Right. And then there's the real stuff. Yeah. And the difference between the two of them is that the, the fakey, fakey stuff has your password like sitting right there in the server. So right. like, the server knows how to decrypt it. So right. we can index it, make it available for search, back it up, that kind of stuff. Makes you that feel good, but th that's what Dropbox has. And it makes you feel good, but it's not really hiding anything from anybody. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know what Dropbox actually know, does. We, but we'll leave them out. <laughs> but it's not a good approach. Uh, okay. That approach is not a good approach. Right. So we wouldn't do that. The problem with doing it for real is that it's really inconvenient for the end user because, for example, you can't index it. You uh -huh. won't be able to search for stuff. Like, the question is, do you want us, do you want Evernote to be able to read your encrypted notes? Right. If the answer is, is no, then it's not really Evernote anymore. We right. can't really, you know, then it just becomes an opaque bit bucket. Right. Um, so there is a way to do it for real and to keep it, you know, to keep it safe and to keep it convenient. But that way is extremely expensive. Got it. Um, and so that's the approach we're going to take when we eventually launch it. And hopefully it'll get a lot cheaper by then. And it'll probably be a premium-only feature. But we don't want to do insurance the easy way that doesn't actually help you. And uh, the real way is either very inconvenient or very expensive. What about individual node encryption? Is that strong encryption that you're using? Yeah, uh, so the individual node, uh, you can select any portion of a node and say encrypt. And that's encrypted on the client side. And uh, we don't see that. We can't decrypt it. Um, and uh, what I, the way that I use it, the way that, that I recommend people use it is don't encrypt the whole thing. So, like, you can have a note that's titled, you know, secret passwords, and then don't encrypt that title. And then in the note, I have, like, you know, I say what the passwords are for, and those aren't encrypted. But then the actual passwords are encrypted. Perfect. So I can still search. I can still say, like, you know, hey, what's my, you know, prodigy.com password? And I can still search for, you know, prodigy password, and it'll find it. Um I don't actually have a Prodigy password. <laughs> I do. But, but I used to. I did. I yeah, we both did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then the actual password is, is encrypted. I would do so. that if you made it easier to encrypt and decrypt, but it's a little bit uh, cumbersome to select, press encrypt, type in the pass. I guess it's not that hard. I'm lazy. Yeah. We, 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 you know, we're certainly open to, to making it easier. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of stuff in Evernote. Look, there's a lot of stuff in Evernote that's cumbersome. Uh, you know, I know it, everyone knows it, uh, and we're working on making it better all the time. In right. fact, like, I am, you know, like, if I'm sitting in a plane and, you know, somebody next to me is using Evernote, which, which, which is happening more and more. You can see everything. Well, no, like, like I... I'm not going to show I, you my Evernote page because I see <laughs> everything in there. Yeah, I'm, in, I'm embarrassed when, when, when I see that. Not for the security stuff. Like, I just feel like... I, it should like, be better. I, yeah, I just feel like I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm like, I wish you were using the, the beta version. It's so no, much better. No. And I'm sorry you have to see that ugly icon and like, and this kind of stuff. Is, is, and I'm like, I literally like, I try to avoid eye contact because I'm like viscerally embarrassed. <laughs> That's that silly because you know what? You should be really proud of it. It is a fantastic well, product. And, and, and I kind of know that at some sense. I have to say, like, look, if I step back, like, it's actually pretty good. And there's, yeah. you know, there's like six million people that use it. And they obviously, most of them like it. But it's that constant, like the constant drive of saying, like, ah, no, we can make it so much better. That, like, I think, I think you need that. I think that's important. So, um, well, and, I'm and some to make it better. Some of it is really just discovery. For instance, you mentioned the Evernote trunk a bunch of times. I, right. There's an icon for the Evernote trunk that I never noticed on my toolbar. I've clicked on it, and there's a ton of third-party stuff yeah. that, for Evernote that I never even knew about. Yeah. It's all taking advantage of you have a very good API, obviously, and developers are loving working with Evernote. Well, and we have our Trump conference uh, on, on Friday, uh, Friday the 24th in San Francisco. And, yeah, we've got, we've got lots of new stuff. We've got prize money. Uh, so anyone in the San Francisco area on August 24th should definitely check it out. It's etc.evernote.com if you're, if you're interested. And evernote.com is a place to get your free copy of Evernote. But uh, if you're on a, a portable device, if you go to your store your app store you'll find it there it's everywhere uh amazon uh android you know google play uh ios windows and everything just but you are totally right like we are 
we are very good at hiding features. Like well, you have too many. <laughs> it's just, it could do anything. I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah. I had no idea that you could store Ableton Live files in Evernote. There you go. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, we, we're, we're doing a better job. So again, on, on Android, we now have all sorts of feature discovery, and we're leaning more on, on tips and, 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 and user stories, and uh, uh, we're doing a lot more of it. So the, the clients are getting much, much more transparent, uh, but there's a long way to go to make it perfect. That's great. Phil Lyman, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, talking a lot about Evernote. You once told me that I, what was the number, th one or two percent of your referrals come come from yeah, me? Yeah, directly from you. Um, <laughs> we, we tracked it at one point. And I think we had something like two and a half percent of our users, you know, like came from, from you talking about Evernote, which is... Uh, it's pretty good. I, you know, we, it's, 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 it's a I lot love of it. people. I love it. Uh, Web4908, one last question. I want to know, are you going to do penultimate for Android tablets? Because we would love to see that on Android tablets. Um, yeah, we're going to do penultimate for, for Android and for all Yay. sorts of stuff. Yay. Uh, absolutely. Um, it may, I don't want to say that it's going to be a general Android app. Because really the thing with penultimate is about how it, it has to be perfect. Like right. Penultimate is beautiful. It has to be better than paper. And so it might be for specific tablets that we know there's a really good experience. Uh, obviously, like, we'll try to do it for everything, but I don't know if we can achieve a perfect penultimate experience generically across, across tablets. But, but any tablets that we can get it to be great on, we'll absolutely do. Fantastic. Phil, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you, Leo. Phil Leibin, Evernote.com. And uh, if you're a developer, go to the Trunk Conference. It's coming soon. You can find out more about that. Somebody was asking in the chat room about the API. If you Google Note, Evernote API, if you Google it, you will find it all there. And it's very well documented, very easy to understand. And uh, I think it really, uh, I mean, well, look at all the third-party apps. It's a testament to the success of the API. That's it for Triangulation for this Wednesday. We do Triangulation every Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern Time, 2200 UTC on Twit.tv. If you watch live... This was great. Was, I got this inspiration from the chat room just now during the show. They said, Leo, we should be the third leg of the stool in triangulation. From now on, we will devote the last part of triangulation to your questions via the chat room. So now there's really a reason to watch live at live.twit.tv. If you can't be here, and I understand it's, you know, for some of you, it's just not a good time. No problem. We make on-demand versions, audio and video, available after the fact. Uh, on our website, twit.tv slash TRI for triangulation. And of course, wherever you get podcasts, subscribe in iTunes. You'll never miss an episode. We always have such great people on this show. It's really fun to do it. Thanks for watching. And we'll see you next week, right? On Triangulation.